um, and our title this week is Global Perspectives on Adult Education and Lifelong Learning. And then we've got a colon, seizing the moment. Um, so welcome, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're absolutely delighted to see you all on this call. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Scylla Ross. I was a commissioner of the Adult Ed um, Commission and also sit upon the steering group and I'm also principal of the Cooperative uh, College. Um, I've got absolute pleasure in handing over uh, to Dame Helen Ghosh, who was the chair of our Centenary Commission. And Helen, without much more ado, I wonder if you'd kindly just frame today's discussion, then return to me and I will briefly introduce our speakers and then ask them to, to, uh, to share their thoughts with us. Thank you very much, Scylla. Um, uh, it's been such a pleasure to take part in these four seminars, the fourth today, um, putting flesh uh, on the recommendations we made as a commission, uh, the Centenary Commission in November last year. Um, those of you who've been involved in all four seminars, I won't repeat the whole history of why we felt it was so important uh, to mark the centenary of the 1919 Commission, but we felt then, and I think through these seminars, the three seminars so far, uh, we felt more and more and more convinced um, that the need for reconstruction that they recognized in 1919, and indeed, as Ken Alyssa was reminding us uh, in last week's seminar, that Beveridge and his team recognized in 1942 is just as powerful today. Uh, we've identified uh, in our report uh, we identified a number of challenges that were just as profound as the challenges that our predecessors faced earlier in the 20th century, uh, whether that was poverty, ignorance, want, uh, or in 1919, the challenge of mechanization, of uh, creating peace or maintaining peace uh, in the world after the dreadful um, conflagration of the First World War, um, or ensuring equality, and most importantly, uh, ensuring full participation of all citizens in democracy and in creating the world for the future. And I think what the message I've taken out of the three seminars so far is that the arguments for adult education and lifelong learning as a key instrument for solving the challenges of today, uh, which are subtly different but just as profoundly challenging uh, and have been in many ways reinforced and underlined by our current COVID-19 crisis. Um, the importance of using adult education and lifelong learning could not be uh, more uh, important for the future of the nation. Um, today's um, session, as well as having the three um, outstanding speakers, Alan, Melissa and Simon talking about global perspectives and, and technologies that can help us. Uh, I'm hoping our sessions will give us new impetus for thinking about how we continue uh, to campaign uh, for the recommendations in the Centenary, in the Centenary Commission. Um, and I'm certainly proposing to follow up uh, straight away after this today's seminar um, with a campaign at a political level in terms of communications with cabinet ministers, with the treasury, uh, with opposition leaders and so on. But I think the importance community has been so important in our discussions and making sure that we engage the whole community through our various networks in a campaign that achieves what we want to achieve, I think is uh, what I'm hoping to learn from today. So that's plenty from me um, and uh, I hand back to Scylla. Thank you very much, Helen. And I think all of the, all of us involved in the call, or the, 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 the three today, the three webinars today, will will be so pleased that we've learned so much. Yes, I, I feel can added to our preliminary thinking, um, and it's great to hear Helen how you know how we're planning to take that forward. So. Thank you very much. Um, I have great pleasure in, in, in uh, briefly introducing our three speakers um, and they'll have roughly five minutes each. Um, the first is, uh, well, all of them will be known to you all, I hope. Uh, the first is Professor Sir Alan Tuckett, who is Vice Chair of the Commission and, and you know, played an incredibly powerful role in helping us put the report together and do the thinking, as, as did all of the Commissioners. And Alan's going to offer a, a global perspective uh, on adult education and lifelong learning. 
Melissa Hyden will follow Alan and she was also a commissioner. She's assistant principal online learning and director of teaching learning and web services at the University of Edinburgh. And Melissa's going to talk to us about how universities are using uh, digital platforms to deliver adult education to new audiences and communities and how the data that we can gather through that or universities are gathering through that um, can help us give us an idea about learner behaviours and, and thus help us think about the sort of uh, courses uh, we can offer and, and develop. And finally, si Simon Parkinson, who is WEA Chief Executive and General Secretary, will be making some observations on the different reasons that people need and wish to access education at the various turning points of their life. So throughout the life course, when they might need different types of learning, for example, for work or on retirement and all the, the huge uh, bits in between. I'm going to be quite strict I'm, I'm going to hold up a very old fashioned piece of paper saying one minute. <laughs> You've broadly got um, five minutes. So um, thank you so much. If we, could, if we could begin with Alan, thank you. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Welcome, Alan. Okay, no joke, the world in five minutes. Um, <laughs> broadly, there's a tension in global policy between a human rights and human capital um, uh, approach. And um, the, the heart of that has been uh, what the World Bank and OECD argue about what we need is um, lifelong learning for skills. Um, the last three years, we've seen the International Labour Office, the World Economic Forum, and the UN all arguing for some kind of universal commitment to, to learning. And the Sustainable Development Goal 4 put promoting lifelong learning into the headline of, um, uh, of the, the, the picture as it went along. Um, uh, the EU is a good illustration of one of the problems of this is that governments will sign up to sort all sorts of things at a broad target and then don't do them in practice. So we have a 15% target for participation in the EU by, by 2020. Um, Britain started off with 29% and now has 14%. No one's cut like we have. Um, and in Europe as a whole, it's moved up by 1%, mainly as a result of the French redesigning things. Um, the global commitment to reduce literacy, uh, illiteracy has led to uh, um, uh, absolutely minimal development over 20 years. There are, though, good strategies, and many of them reinforce things we said in the Commission. So countries that do well have good national strategies, like Korea and Singapore, um, they, uh, or embedded processes between national and local, like Scandinavian countries, Germany and Austria. Um, there are laws in Norway and Switzerland to commit to stable provision, but there is an uh, important commitment uh, along with our view about devolution to de devolution to regional sub-regional levels. UNESCO's Learning Cities, Suwon, where there's a learning centre uh, within 20 minutes of everybody's house and a, a library within 10 minutes, Swansea, Cork. Uh, Cape region in South Africa, or local community centres in Bangladesh, all good illustrations of that. Key role for local government, again, we, we said that. Um, a commitment to individual learning accounts that you see working alongside support for communities in, in Singapore is matched in our work by community, uh, 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 community learning accounts. And you could see the Scandinavian study circles as a version of that if you're thinking about how to proceduralize it altogether. A commitment to basic skills, certainly there in, in the UN, in the words of what people commit to, but very few people have done as well as the UK did in the first decade of this century. What we need to go back, do is go back and learn from ourselves. Finally, um, on, act, uh, on our uh, goals that I picked out, active citizenship education is worrying a, a large number of us in the light, not only of the growth of popu uh, populism in, in uh, 
in the industrial world, but also in response to the issues thrown up by climate change or, or, um, or, or, or the COVID crisis. And Bridge 47, a, a, a EU-wide cooperation around uh, active citizenship seems something worth linking to. The Swedes' commitment on migration policy. And then the wonderful thing about innovation against the dominant theme, Italy has very little formal adult education, but an autonomous region uh, supports third age um, uh, work in Italy in a most extraordinary and varied way. It's like U3A with a, with a rocket under it. And so um, finally, if we want inspiration on how we work together, the kind of popular budget making they do in the south of Brazil and Porto Alegre, the work of Freire and Boal, the idea that you can um, uh, dance and imagine your way into the future. There's lots of illustrations of it. And it's not much more than five minutes, but there we are. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alan. That was perfect, perfectly on time, but you left me reeling with the thought of uh, the University of the Third Age with a rocket underneath. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. It's really helpful and informative. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Melissa. You next, please. Do you have my slides or shall I share my screen? We're going to see them now. Go. Lovely. I'm going through them pretty fast at the beginning, so I'm going to say next slide for whoever's um, poking That's it. That's fine, Melissa. Thank you. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about delivering adult education at a global scale rather than a, a global view on it. So next slide. So University of Edinburgh. Um, in the report, we talked about how you should only be using the word university if you're delivering adult education and lifelong learning to communities um, and that the university seeks to serve, which in all cases much in must include our own localities. So next slide, you can see the mission of the University of Edinburgh, that first one, significant, sustainable, socially responsible contribution to Scotland, the UK, the world. So we start local and then we expand. We have, of course, all the other uh, mission statements that you would expect to see from a university. So next slide. So we're a university that does have, still has, a Centre for Adult Education. It's now called Centre for Open Learning. Um, very few left, as you know, but in the old universities, we still have one. But we also have, next slide, um, a big commitment to online learning. And those two are not so separated as people might think. We do postgraduate online courses, we do free short courses, and we do specific CPD micro qualifications. Next slide. So we have 70 postgraduate online courses in all of those um, subjects. That's full master's online offered at a distance. Next slide. And we do have data about the people who study with us, and the demographic is different, of course, for the online courses. But we have those 70 online masters. We also have uh, 50, um, 55 now massive open online courses, which are MOOCs um, on the next slide. So I thought the commission was particularly interested in the kind of MOOCs that we offer that have a face-to-face -face or cultural element. So I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, obviously the biggest MOOCs we have, the 500,000 learners is the introduction to philosophy and fundamentals of music theory, 300,000. Those are offered purely at a distance. The ones that have a community base, I thought were interesting for this project talking about. So the Jacobites, that's in conjunction with the museum and people go to the museum and look at the items in the collection and also um, study along with the course. How to read a novel is done in conjunction with the book festival, the Edinburgh Book Festival, International Book Festival. So the books that are read in how to read a novel are the ones that are up for the James Tate Black um, Prize each year. And the um, people who attend the uh, festival or can't attend the festival tune in um, and the authors who are in Edinburgh for the festival contribute to the teaching of the course and then the prizes are announced at the end of the festival. Um, football, more than just a game, this one is the one that is um, offered in conjunction with Hibs um, and also uh, Barcelona football teams um, and the local um, uh, learning centers that are in the football stadia. So people come to the football stadia and work through the material um, in the community. And then of course, in terms of rebuild and the crisis now, 
the COVID-19, we launched that last week and we have 35,000 learners on that right now. So that seemed to be the classy thing for an institution to be doing. So next slide. So just to say that the universities use digital platforms to deliver adult education and we reach 3 million adults around the world. These are courses with no prerequisites other than access to the internet. Um, in terms of community learning and workplace skills for rebuilding. So yesterday, Nicola Sturgeon launched a um, portal for skills for work um, in the light of so many staff being furloughed or unemployed. Um, and that portal features all of these courses from University of Edinburgh and Edinburgh itself launched the critical care um, course online. So that has shifted a lot of what we're thinking about right now, the ability to turn around a course that fast and get it in, into people's homes, 37,000 people signing up for a course at very short notice. That's the other thing that digital allows us to do is go very fast, very local, get right into people's homes with the education that they need. And all of this is funded, of course, because people buy certificates when they complete the online courses and that money flows back to the university. One of the things we have talked about that I am particularly interested in is how the data about all of these learners and what they're doing, um, where that is. And at the moment, it belongs to the platforms and to the university who owns, which own the courses. It's not publicly available. And so we, when we ask questions about how do we know what people are learning, how they're learning, why they're learning, at what time do they learn, at what times in their careers do they learn. There's a whole bunch of data being gathered by those platforms that isn't publicly available or even available to researchers. So the next slide just has, um, I think, a bunch of links for anybody who would like to know more about any of the stuff. That's me. I'm done. Thank you very much indeed, Mel. What, e what extraordinary figures. <laughs> really uh, extraordinary. Uh, if we could just close that slide deck down, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was really, really interesting and just shows the incredible scope of what can be done and the reach. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Simon, um, welcome. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you and we I know we have a deck of slides to show for you as well so thank you very much thanks Silla. yeah and good afternoon everyone delighted to to be able to join you this afternoon this is going to be a quick canter um through some some personal thoughts on on lifelong learning um i've entitled it rebuilding the highway for anybody um, that's got a connection with wea you may you may know where i'm going with some of this so chloe if you can move on for me that'd be lovely so I want to start with, we, you know, Alan rightly said that in terms of funding and policy, there's some big, big areas and we'll touch on those. But actually for me, there's a cultural piece that we, we need to work on. And, and that came through in the work of the commission. You know, it starts with us as individuals. We have to, we have to regather and, and reframe this culture and attitude towards lifelong learning. You know, it's a choice that we have. It's a right that we have and we need to exercise it. And we need to make sure that we create the environments in which we can maximize those choices. So workplaces, communities, families, they all need to understand the positive impact of lifelong learning. And I think that's the campaign part that, that Helen was talking about. Again, as Alan said, you know, lots of, of focus on functional skills and, and supporting people to become ep economically active. But we all know, I think, that lifelong learning is far more than that. And I think today's COVID-19 crisis reinforces that. You know, how in a changing world do we build um, attributes such as resilience, community activism, creative and critical thinking, as well as those functional skills? So, Chloe, if you can move it on for me. So I don't, I don't think there is, particularly in England, I don't think the formal education system is helping us. And I think it needs joining up. We, we all know that too often a poor school experience where young people leave disengaged with school with few or no formal qualifications almost means that it's very unlikely they re-engage with learning unless they come into contact 
with one of the organizations you know represented on this call and and as part of this commission and i believe we're now seeing that generational and um, downward spiral that generation on generation have have come through you know mediocre school experience and and that has impacted um in terms of their their aspiration to carry forward with learning the policy and the funding hasn't helped that, particularly in England. I know colleagues in Wales may, may say that the legislation there is slightly better and Alan's pointed to other areas across Europe where it's helpful. So I, I agree, I think we need to join the policy up, join the funding up and we need a national lifelong learning strategy. Again, if we can move on, Chloe. So this rebuilding the highway of learning, I think Alan said we need to go back and learn from ourselves again. That's certainly where I'm coming from. As early as 1907, um, Albert Mansbridge was saying, let's work to construct that free and open highway so that um, it's only the only tolls being mentality and high character. I'm not sure he had the highway, um, you know, he imagined the highway that I've, I've pictured on this slide, but it's really relevant because it's certainly not a linear journey. And it's a journey where people need to start and stop, be able to move at their own place, pace. I think we now refer to this as life transitions and we need to do more and more in terms of the change in job market, returning mums and dads, working post retirement age. There is a lifelong and a life wide element to this. So finally, Chloe, if we can move on. So is the digital superhighway the answer? I think Melissa's shown us that it's certainly part of the answer. And there's no doubt that there's a wealth of knowledge there and that it's freely available. But that's only as long as you're not suffering in digital poverty or digital exclusion. So there are still tolls on this superhighway for us. You know, that ability to fund broadband and the equipment is seeing more and more of our communities being left behind, not embraced as, as digital increases. And there's almost too much out there. So as, as organizations and as supporters, we need to curate this into, in use, into useful packages and programs. And then even with all the knowledge in the world, there's still a place for us to build um, the, the, and apply that knowledge into skills and interactions. So for us, we feel there'll always be that need for community-based face-to-face learning, and particularly in the most disadvantaged communities. So I hope that's bang on five minutes, a canter through, and, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Simon. Wonderful points made by each speaker. And I've just come up from a meeting before I came to this, which was the Greater Manchester Cooperative Commission, which Simon himself used to sit upon. And the focus in that meeting was around digital poverty. You know, that, that all of those councils sitting around Greater Manchester, that huge region, were saying, right, how are we going to address that? Uh, because of, because of the, the, you know, the, the experience that people who are, ex are currently going through who don't have the sort of access that we have on this call. So thank you very much. Three wonderful speakers. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to Chris, who I think is going to make you do some of the work. You have a task to do, some facilitation to do, um, and there's a question that we're going to ask you all to address, as we have done in previous weeks. I suspect it will be posted up in your breakout rooms as well. But the question is, just so you can start thinking about it, how do we build a campaign to put adult education and lifelong learning at the heart of the reconstruction agenda? Before I pass over to you, Chris, I'll also remind colleagues, we've got some wonderful chat taking place. and We'll make sure we capture that and share that. But if people want to respond and engage as it emerges, please, please do. So thank you, Chris. Hi everybody, uh, just a quick uh, two minutes from me. Uh, we're we're going to open five breakout rooms and there'll be a facilitator in each room. Um, hopefully we've uh, named them so that they should stand out in the, in the participant uh, box. And um, we've also pasted the um, question into the chat box. So I don't know if facilitators want to grab a copy of that to paste in their own rooms when we open the rooms in a moment. And if I could also ask if the uh, facilitators are able to 
hit record for us in the breakout rooms, that would be fantastic so that we can assemble it into a, into a video later. Um, I think that's it from me. So I'll just get ready to open the rooms on to tell us say so. Go, go ahead, please, Chris. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name's Mel. I'm um, the facilitator for um, this group. So we usually have about um, 15 minutes to um, have a bit of a discussion around the question that's been posed to us all. So um, can I just ask, it's probably useful if you just, if you, um, if you unmute and if you want to uh, contribute something, um, then do please raise your hand. Those of you that can't, um, that haven't got uh, your uh, cameras on, if, if you want to use the um, raising hand screen button, uh, which is at the bottom of your screens, if you're on a, on a, a computer, then please do so. Um, if you can't, I will come around and just check for those people who uh, we can't see because it's a bit more difficult. So the question we've been asked to think about is how do we build a campaign to put adult education and lifelong learning at the heart of the reconstruction agenda? So, anybody that would like to start us off? Um, I don't mind going. Go um, on, be brave, be brave. <laughs> I'm Hester and um, I work for Birkbeck, University of London. Um, so, I guess from my perspective, I work in a very ge geographically specific area, Newham in East London, and um, have like worked to sit on the community impact um, working group in the local authority alongside adult social care and other um, kind of more, I suppose, direct services um, to kind of ensure that learning and also like the university perspective is, is present when thinking about community impact and recovery on the local level. So that's a point about, is, so your point is about joining up with other agencies? I think like, well, working within local authority systems um, and to engage with the conversations that are going on now around community impact. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's certainly, I think, um, those of you that were on the call last week, that, that really important role of local authorities was, was, was certainly coming through, I think, um, uh, through those kind of conversations. Okay, any other thoughts? Hi, Ruth. Hello, hi. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. So I come at this topic, I think, uh, sorry, I'm a, I'm a uh, research fellow here at uh, Kellogg College, uh, working with Jonathan Mitchie. Um, and I tend to come at this topic from the kinds of uh, research that I've done with organisations in the midst of change. Uh, including those who've got an alternative ownership structure, employee owned or, or cooperative. And in increasingly these organisations have to work in extended multi-stakeholder initiatives in order to uh, make the kinds of changes which are sustainable and all the rest of it. But very often the part that they neglect, it seems to me, is a systematic approach to learning so that the multi-stakeholders tend to get you know a kind of short introduction to something which is of corporate interest and will benefit the corporation in the, in the initiative that they've got underway but it doesn't necessarily uh, it doesn't necessarily connect into something which is about uh, the participants as learners and i just wonder whether there might be some bridges that could be made to organizations of all kinds private public and other uh, that are engaged in these kinds of system level changes and helping them to think more broadly about what learning looks like for their participants thank you is that because is that because um learning organizations are not represented in that multi-stakeholder group ruth well, the organisations would probably call themselves learning organisations, so they would be proud to have that designation. But the, the learning that takes place within the midst of the action, it's very focused upon what the outcomes are from the corporate perspective. So if you're looking at supply chains, for example, and you're trying to look at maybe um, improving the productivity of a crop, 
the learning might be around uh, something very specific to do with the crop um, maintaining it harvesting it making sure that it you know does all the things that is needed but it's it doesn't necessarily then extend to something which is about the developmental possibilities of the local farmers or um, the, the the local participants, which takes them beyond what the corporation needs. Mm. So what I'm saying is, you know, why not have that as part of a more systematic program of learning for people at all levels of an initiative from the bottom upwards? Because for sure, so many of uh, the participants at the bottom of supply chains need to have their human capabilities developed and they need to have them developed beyond what is simply necessary for meeting the needs of the corporation i hope that makes some sense yeah no that does uh, that does that does very much make sense yeah making explicit the kind of learning and moving mm. it beyond the sort of it's a bit i suppose it's a bit like that kind of you know the the uh the skills agenda kind of you know, yes, limitation. and of course the skills the skills agenda is really really important, um, but unless it's set in a, a framework which is a progressive and developmental for that person as they go on their lifelong journey, um, then then it, it just fixes them where they are. Uh, they can't necessarily grow beyond that immediate experience, and that's possibly one of the limitations of a, a purely a skills based approach rather than a human capability approach. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, any other thoughts, views? Yep, Wes. Wes and then Joseph. Okay, um, Wes, I'm up in, the, I'm just south of Bristol, uh, Bridgewater, Somerset. Um, I was on a, a climate change conversation earlier this week, uh, and one of the things which was being discussed there was why um, businesses and people aren't stepping forward to actually do something uh, and one of the things which was noted was that normally we'd expect to follow government instruction and that's how we operate you know so we, we used to being told what to do uh, whereas the world which seems to be coming into being is a world where we can actually participate and actually take action so if we look at the the COVID situation that's what people are doing they're, they're stepping forward and doing something uh, and it would be good if we were doing that in all the other areas of society where we need to do something as well. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether there's a way to actually tie these things together. So actually as opposed to looking at it from being a lifelong learning aspect, but just but perhaps just uh, initiating that core ability of people or businesses to make their own decisions for themselves. Thank you. So, how how would we how would we factor that into a a campaign then around learning? <laughs> yeah, the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really interesting one, um, um, and it is about that kind of nature of the possibilities, isn't it? I think that's um, that, that's really interesting at the moment. Um, I'm just going to go to Joseph and then come back to you, Ruth, if that's okay. Joseph? Right. Can you, yes, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I don't want to sound too doubtful, but I see a lot of goodwill. In fact, I, I sense a great deal of goodwill around the place. Um, I'm basically, by the way, 10 years retired university lecturer who taught entirely on vocational courses. People went out and got jobs and qualifications, and that's why they were there. They were never, no other reason. Uh, and then involved in adult education later on. Um, but I'm concerned, actually, without being too negative, there's a great deal of goodwill, but who will own? I've heard, heard this, but look at this expression, um, reconstruction agenda. And I'm wondering who's going to own that agenda. Um, because the impression I'm getting, I don't want to worry anyone, is we're, we're facing financial Armageddon. And there is a view amongst many politicians, hopefully not, um, uh, Lord, I forgot his name, the Lord who we got with us, um, which is basically, this is all, this is all flim flam. This can be all be swept away along with a lot of other things. Who wants to hear about lifelong learning and so on? So it's how does one campaign against those ideas? Because uh, I feel there's goodwill, there's a lot of interesting work going on, but I also feel there's a big steamroller, which is going to be called um, fiscal, financial, 
economic Armageddon, and I think it's on its way, to be honest. Thank you, Joseph. Ruth, you were going to come back, and then I'll go to Lord Delmoyer. Yes, I, I just wanted to make an attempt at uh, your, your question about um, crafting a campaign, because clearly this is this is the the big next step forward, and um, uh, just sort of basically, just for basic thinking, um, I just wonder whether it's a matter of first of all finding the audiences, you know, finding those constituencies. Uh, groups of people who will be interested in this and then crafting a communications bridge building um, process with them so that they have a full understanding of what is being recommended here. Then there's something to do with auditing all the sort of traditional instruments of, of lobbying and seeing well where is the purchase in terms of policy making? Is, is it necessary to go to a think tank? Can we go directly to some kind of a, a committee or, or group of MPs within Parliament and again educate them in, in what this is being proposed here? And then maybe uh, building something with um, media outlets uh, so that they can actually do some of this work uh, for us. And it just seems to me that this is just going to be a matter of doing what's always needed in terms of building a campaign, the audiences, the, the political process and and the, the media and communications part of it is, is probably what's going to be needed here. Thank you. Uh, Okay, we seem to have lost. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Any final thoughts that we want to? I'm back. I'm back. Hi, hi, hi. We thought we'd lost you there. Just very quickly, just uh, responding to what Joseph said. Uh, in, in my role at the CBI, where I'm vice president, mm -hmm. uh, we're looking ahead now to, to the uh, economy getting started once we come out of lockdown. And uh, Joseph's absolutely right. Whichever way you look at it, it's not looking good. The damage um, that has been done to the economy uh, is pretty pretty severe and sadly there are going to be lots of people with the best will in the world the best efforts of the government there will be uh, people already on unemployment and increasingly so and and this is the opportunity where the government we see it as a restart revival and renewal in the phases of the restart of, of coming out of the lockdown and this is where government will have to in the way that it's investing billions of pounds at the moment well, it's going to have to invest the money in adult education, in skilling with all those people who are sadly going to be out of work, um, giving them the chance to learn and to reskill and increase their skills. Um, and there are going to be new opportunities that have been created from this as well. Uh, and this is, a, I see it as a big opportunity for adult education and which the government will have to invest in in a big way uh, for the benefit of the economy. So can I just ask then, is, is, um, is from the kind of CBI perspective, is that are businesses then seeing the value of adult learning in the, in the future, in that revive and start? Is it, is, it, is it really present there? Not at the moment. At the moment, yeah. unfortunately, the way the apprentice levy has been applied, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All, that's almost seen as an additional tax, an additional burden uh, that bigger businesses have to go through. But here, this is going to be seen as a necessity and an opportunity. Um, and, and not only businesses themselves championing it, but actually the government championing it uh, with people who are going to be out of work. And uh, there may be millions out of work uh, soon who will need to be uh, reskilled and increase their skills. And, 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 and I, that's where the opportunity is going to be. And, and this is where government can step in. Has to step in, I believe. Do you, do you think it's inevitable? I mean, is that the, you know, is that is that is that the perspective from the from the CBI CBI? No, it's not the CBI. It's ev everywhere. Whichever yeah. way, with the OBR, they say, oh, mm. the drop thirty five percent this quarter, and, and and it could be worse. So there's no running away from that reality. Now, hopefully, it's short term un unemployment and not long term. But whichever way it is, there will be a need uh, for adult education very very soon. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to call out one last time for any final thoughts and then I'll try and summarise because if we have to kind of feed back. Anyone who hasn't had an opportunity to speak? Okay, so um, I think there's something um, about those, um, so there's definitely something about that opportunity uh, that, that a campaign has to tie into, I think, doesn't it, in terms of 
you know, the realities that we're going to face, um, the campaign has to kind of tie into those, um, those conversations, really. And also tie into those conversations, I think, which Hannah made at the beginning, which is around um, locking into those um, uh, local authority groups that are already starting to have these conversations. Um, and then I think that's, that's that, um, the point that you made, Ruth, about that kind of ensuring somehow a systematic approach to learning that will be, because it's going to have to, there's going to have to be that kind of multi-stakeholder initiatives and, and making sure it's not just about getting people back into the workplace, but learning and development for life and kind of moving on and, and what the kind of, the kind of society will look like really. Um, and those usual kind of processes that you need to build around um, uh, a, a kind of a, any kind of campaign. Is that all right with everyone? I think everybody in the room should have the ability to unmute themselves. I hope so. So can we, you know, people just try that for me? So they know I don't need to do anything else? Yeah, yep, seems to be perfect. Oh, thanks, Chris. Nice to see you. Um, so we've been we've been set, and Chris has just um, helpfully put the question at the top of the screen. I'm hoping everyone can see that. So how do we build a campaign to put adult education and lifelong learning at the heart of the reconstruction agenda? Um, if we if we want to, I can see the participation list on my screen. If people want to raise their hands on that list or, or raise their hands physically, I'll try and watch out for you, and we'll try and put a little bit of order into the into the proceedings but is there anybody keen to to kickstart our discussions Nigel I think I saw a hand a, a real hand up there yeah yeah one whose nerves broke first <laughs> um, I, it was just a thought really that um, I mean we're only relevant if we're relevant aren't we and I guess one of the things we should be doing is trying to chart an understanding of what the landscape is likely to be socially and economically uh, when we come out of this dreadful virus situation um, or if we come out of it completely because nobody knows do they and um, you know what will be waiting there for us I mean there are clearly big trans I mean, the immediate examples that hit me are there there's there's a there's a big change in the way that those who are used to being digitally connected um, have accomplished. I know lots of people who are nervous about using Zoom at community level in other ways, hadn't done it before, and now use it as a matter of course. Um, will they go on doing that? Is that likely to become a much more important part of the way we communicate and relate to each other? Um, and the other one are those kind of big issues, I suppose, around um, uh, 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 around health sort of managing the effects of, um, of, of having had this lockdown period um, and of course the big monster that will be waiting for us once this monster has gone is uh, is climate change and almost an unexpected byproduct of where we are I guess is that we're, we're seeing some pretty significant improvements in things like air quality and carbon emissions and um, also revivals of urban gardening and things like that at the nature and wildlife end of the climate crisis. Um, how, how do we demonstrate that adult learning, adult education you know, has a role to play in taking forward those agendas? Because it might be a moment where um, public authorities, maybe even parts of the private sector, feel bold enough to um, to do things that they wouldn't do in normal circumstances. I think of things like traffic management in cities and so on. You know, it just might be a you know particularly opportune moment. Oh, thank you, Nigel. That you know that that makes sense. Others want to come in at that point. And um, Pat, I think I see your I'm hand up. I'm speaking from Scotland, and I've been involved in developing um, uh, personal development programs in the corporate sector. Um, for 16 years. I think a question is, who, are, are there ways in which we could campaign to persuade big business to look at their corporate social responsibility policies again and to see what their efforts might be? That certainly worked for me in the past and might, might be an opportune moment just now. And the other part is, how do we engage the people themselves in this campaign? 
so that it's very people-centered, very learner-centered, and maybe looking for some really positive examples of projects that have been sustainable. Sorry, that's rather a lot. Oh, thank, thank you, Pat. That makes sense. I think I saw Chris wants to come in and then Martin, I think. Thanks, Simon. Uh, just picking up on Pat's point, really, I think there's a really crucial uh, element of kind of what works in all of this, because, um, I mean, as we begin to sort of transition, hopefully, out of the uh, COVID crisis, although in some respects it's being sort of seen as a period of reflection, actually, things are moving really fast and things will escalate even faster, you know, once, once, uh, once social distancing and things like that start to be relaxed. So I think we need to be ready with a bunch of good examples of both what adult learning has done before the crisis and has always been good at, and also some really good examples of how we've adapted during the crisis and supported communities there so that we can go in with those, you know, evidenced uh, examples towards towards the, uh, you know, when, when, when people are looking for solutions for what next. Thanks, Chris. Martin, I think you, you signalled you wanted to come in. Yes, thank you. Um, I think one of the most important and exciting elements of the new landscape is the rise of the mutual aid groups. Um, it's difficult to know how many people are involved in them, um, but uh, it must be in the order of four or five million people, is uh, my guess from what I've read so far. And I think that is a fantastic potential for a new campaign for lifelong learning particularly a potential for embedding citizenship learning um, in this new movement. Um, how do we go about it? Well, I think one of the ways we go about it is we have to see if we can restore that great strength of uh, 10 or 20 years ago, which were the local campaigns for Adult Learners Week, which brought together all the major providers in the field. And I think in, in every city, in every town, every village, people who are involved in providing or have an interest in providing adult learning should be banding together and having this discussion straight away. Uh, it's a great opportunity and it will pass us by if we're not careful. And uh, by the way, Simon, I speak as a WEA ambassador. Thank you, Martin. Um, that, that's excellent. There's a strong WEA presence in this breakout room. So, so thank you. And anybody else would like to come in? Um, Willie? Right, yes, thank you. Um, and thank you to Martin for that. Um, because, I mean, and I don't want to get all academic over it. There's a, the, the, there's a danger of pouring over what the question means and what we mean about the reconstruction agenda. Some of what I've heard feels like a bit of an, and as a head of department, I should be doing this, a bit of an opportunistic, opportunistic how, where, I, where can I get money to, 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 to fund the thing I'm calling lifelong learning? What I liked about what Martin had to say there was it's about seizing the social opportunities here. And, and, and letting lifelong learning do what it needs to do, which is which is which is to go where where the learners need it to go. Um, so so for me, it isn't about trying to be strategic to get money to tick boxes that government might have. It's to work with the people um, who are trying to work together, and and and, and where, where can we insert ourselves and help support that 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 growth and evolution. Um, so I, I think I would endorse the flavour of what I understood Martin to be saying. Thanks. Thanks, Willie. Anybody else wanting to come in? I think Pat wants to come back in again. Yep. Pat? I would endorse what Martin's saying. I think having something that's learner-centred, the learners are going to drive that and it's going to be sustainable and it's going to be diverse and it's going to create the agenda. And that's certainly what I've found over the 16 years. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. Um, any other any other contributions? F Philippa and then Nigel. Nice to hear from you, Philippa. Um, my background's in secondary education, um, and one of the things that I think runs counter to what um, we've been saying about the um, groups, um, uh, you know, moving forward and um, uh, creating wonderful new opportunities. 
at the same time as that's happening, we've also got a lot of um, much younger people falling through the cracks at a much younger age. So one of the things I'd want to focus on with um, campaigning um, is that danger actually in the future. We've got lots of opportunities and I'm not trying to be too gloomy, but we've actually got um, massive issues coming up with, in my experience, youngsters in their early, early um, secondary um, education where they're just disappearing. And because of the academy structure, uh, youngsters aren't being supported as much as they, they were, say, 10 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So although we've got massive opportunities, there are also some very big issues to do with the fragmentation of education in, in, in my situation. That, that's all. Thanks. Um, thanks, Philippa. And Nigel, I, I, know, I know you won't mind because Keith was flagging he wanted to come in as well. And we've not heard from Keith yet. And then we'll come back back to you, Nigel. There you go, Keith. I'd yes, like sir. you to pull rank. You, you're all right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I thought the previous, well, all the speakers previously, but I think that the issue of young people is one that's really very neglected. And I think a lot of organisations, I mean, including the WEA, which I'm involved with, we, we have a very elderly cohort of people. And I think there needs to be a lot more work engaging young people and developing learning strategies that allow them to participate so i'm i'm really interested in trying to do that i don't have any magic solutions but i think empowerment is really one of the keys to a lot of this and that probably applies to lots of groups i mean people who have mental illness or social uh, you know socially uh, difficult i think it is about empowering those groups and it doesn't necessarily require a lot of money but i think it does require a commitment within communities and i think this the present circumstances where you've started to see communities come mm. together by support in, in very local ways is really quite something that's got to be lost it's got to be worked at and built on now thank you thank, thanks keith nigel oh um it was just a, a, a brief response to the point that Pat raised right at the beginning about um, corporate responses to uh, future of lifelong learning. In, in a breakout session last week that I think Keith and I were in, um, Lord Billamoria, who was a Centenary Commission member and is big wig in the CBI, I think he's about to be president nationally, um, said he had some idea or indicated he had some ideas to share about um, uh, corporate responses but he was going to raise them at the in the plenary at the end but as it happened there wasn't time to do that I, I don't know if he's on the um, list today as a participant but it would certainly be worth following him up on that I think see um, you know I think it was I think he'd been thinking about it and um, you know it'd be, it'd be a shame to lose that I think I did see him on the participant list, Nigel. So you know we can we can check that. Um, I'm conscious we've we've probably got um, only a couple of minutes left. The five minute warning came up a couple of minutes ago. Any last contributions before I try and feed back to you what I think I've I've heard and and where we might put some of the the points back. Willie. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I suppose, you know, kind of picking up on what, what, what Philip and a little bit what he said, um, I, I'm from the Department for Lifelong Learning at the University of Sheffield. We, 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 we run foundation years for mature students. They're, they're a bit like access to HE programmes, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, but we are very much mature students. Um, so we do see that younger cohort. So for me, lifelong learning is precisely the kind of learners that Philippa is describing, actually. They had a shit time at school, but they need to be engaged with learning much, much, much quicker than the ways that we can make that happen better. So, so this kind of national lifelong learning agenda thing, I absolutely see the, 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 the need and the relevance for that. I'm just really keen that what we do remains very very much embedded in, 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 in social purpose, addressing social disadvantage. Um, so it has a real political edge to it because I think that that ultimately is what will suspect, sustain a, a campaign for the long term that, that make, makes us all much, much more relevant to, through the lifetime. Okay, thanks, Willie. We've got, I think you can see as well, there's a two minute sort of warning. So shall I try and um, 
feedback to you what I think I've heard and, and some of the scenes that we can take forward. What I'm hearing loud and clear, and, and it picks up on that last point, is that when we talk about adult learning, we mean, you know, 19 plus, it's got to be, you know, um, for, for everybody. And that actually, rather than thinking that this crisis is a moment of reflection and things are slowing down, actually things are moving quite quickly. And we need to make sure that we're relevant, that as soon as we come out of this, that we're, we're relevant as a movement, that we're talking about, you know, the big issues around health, digital inclusion, climate change, and also that we're reminding big business of their, um, the role that they could play in this through, through their CSR policies and, and other ways. And actually, it has got to be a movement. It's got to be a movement that engages with this new, potentially new civic sort of sense that we can see through the mutual aid groups that Martin went, that, that Martin mentioned. So if there are a couple of million people, you know, who are now actively come together to, to do something positive in their community during this crisis, how do we harness that? How do we make sure that it really is movement building rather than just trying to grab funding for different institutions to do different programs? Is there anything other than what I've just said that you think I've, I've missed badly from our conversation? You haven't missed it from the conversation because nobody's mentioned it, but I think one of the things we should think about um, is the role of local authorities in all of this. There's a growing mood amongst local authorities to try and relate to what's going on at the base throughout the country and to support it. Um, the cooperative councils are an important part of this and I think we should be looking to them as well as to the mayors in the, in the cities uh, to work with them on this campaign. Anybody like to make a first response? Tom. Well, just to get things going, I'm, I, I was interested in the notion of transitions, and I'm wondering if a campaign might centre around uh, key transitions in the life course. Could we identify three, four, five ones? I mean, Alan once uh, made the proposal that I think at age 50, everyone gets the offer of an entitlement you know, a fresh entitlement to learning. And that still seems to me a pretty valid idea. So you could campaign for, uh, just as kids, most young people get, in a sense, an entitlement of a kind at 18, but I mean, one at, uh, one at uh, whatever ages we choose or whatever points we choose. So uh, similarly, maybe one with your first pension comes um, an offer of um, an entitlement of some kind. So uh, it would just be a way of organising um, an entitlements campaign. That's an interesting idea because it ties it very much to rights, doesn't it? So learning is a right. Thank you. Anybody else like to comment on that or have any other ideas about how we could build um, adult education, how we put this central to reconstruction. By the way, just think, oh, thank you, Alan. I'll just come to you in a minute. I was just re reflecting on that, Tom. In the light of, <laughs> I, I keep thinking, I'm not just going to think recovery, actually, I'm going to keep keep with reset and recovery, I think. Um, but but thinking about what we emerge, how we emerge after this period, thinking about, we'll have to rethink what those moments are, won't we? Because who knows what the world will look like or will it look very different? So that's just a thought. Thank you, Alan. Microphone, You're Alan. You're muted. I said I, I spent my working life answering this question. <laughs> you did. <laughs> More or less incompetent failure. Um, <laughs> I mean, it does seem to me that the, the issue about Britain's regions and the um, enormous um, challenge about being a country together is the way to, to, to focus on it. And that um, uh, rebuilding from the ground upwards is frankly more likely than, than someone falling out the sky with the economic challenges after after COVID and the demands inevitably that will be there for strengthening health services and so on. Um, 
I, I think it's um, uh, looking at the learning regions, looking at uh, local authorities, and re rebuilding a, a dialogue a, a, with other sorts of providers so that you build a kind of a recovery of the, the idea of the highway that Simon was talking about. So just an alternate, I like, obviously I like the idea of big birthday, you know, I thought of it a bit like the Queen um, is uh, 100th when you used to get a telegram. I thought if every big birthday you got a... You, you got you Alan Tuckett coming with a voucher. Yeah. Hey? Then you get people. Alan Tuckett coming instead of the Queen with a voucher. Yeah, there you are with a voucher, how nice, yeah. Thank you. But I mean, I think, I mean, I, yeah, you're very timely reminded you spent your life trying to answer this, but, but I just wonder if, if the situation we currently find ourselves in, yeah, I mean, is it different? I mean, it's a silly question in a way because we don't know how different it'll be. Yeah, um, but you know, this notion of local learning, this notion of region, I mean, is, is, do you think we've seen a shift in that? And is that where we should focus the campaign? Well, could, could, I, could I make one observation, which is that in some way, although we're, th this is this um, emergency has made us much poorer and, in, and um, uh, you know, economically and so on, it has a major effect in that case, in, in that way. Um, I think in, in, a, in a lot of ways, it's made people realize that there's there are there's a richness to the i don't know the slowness shall we put it that way of the uh of of the kind of lockdown uh, uh system so i i wonder whether one of the ways is to try to capture some of the benefits of the lockdown which um you know in terms of slowness but also in terms of new ways of creating community you know the way in which we interact i mean i don't know uh, we interact more with people in our streets typically now i think uh, although we don't meet them we wave at them across the street and so on uh, we give people a lot we, we walk much further away from people if we walk past them but we greet them perhaps more than we used to you know, I mean, I'm speaking here of people one never knew, one doesn't know, but you know, that there's a kind of warmth in the distance. I, I wonder whether there's something about capturing the different experience that we have now in, I mean, this may be in the same way that people kind of carried on for donkey's years talking about the Dunkirk spirit and all that kind of stuff, you know, but there's something in that, isn't there? They're coming together. Yeah. I think that's interesting. I mean, dare I say the sort of notion of slow learning, which almost is anti, I mean, compared to the way that learning has speeded up using digital contexts, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's very different. And it's that possibly it's that sort of deep dive rather than that, that, sh that sort of shallow learning, which is, you know, that that's some of the stuff that we've, we, we've been exposed to over recent years. And I've, I've just been writing a blog this morning. I, I read this one as a very young woman. Um, and, you know, I think that's the extraordinary, it's very dirty and mucky and it's even got bits of golden Virginia in from when I used to smoke, it's that old. But but, but point, that notion of, of learning together mutually for, for around what we need to do in our regions um, and, and, and it being, it having that sort of, social purpose you know may, maybe that's that that's something too thank you malcolm i mean i think i think we've seen it actually it's just really to just to follow on from that we've seen that we've seen great failures of the incumbent government i'm not actually making that as a party political point but we see i know Scylla and i have spent some time discussing how we could do some research around the, and I don't know if that's what's driven you to uh, mutual aid again, the mutual aid societies, that actually the, I, so many things have disappeared. And one of them is this notion that there's no society, as Thatcher infamous, infamously said. Well, clearly that's absolutely wrong. It's completely wrong. And we see it time and time again in all the different networks which have sprung up. 
Um, and I think in a way that's what John was talking about. It, you know, it's actually, it's gone beyond the sort of saying hello and it's the, the offering of help to strangers and things. And I wonder if that's an energy which can be harnessed for something like this, because people have realized they do live in communities, that they do have neighbors. But do they Thank see you, adult education as the answer to that? Well, but that's what we need to persuade them, Alan. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's why I think a national campaign isn't likely to be as effective as working from the ground upwards. So uh, you're saying that the argument, you don't feel that we can, um, we could realise uh, any of those three points by having that sort of national campaign approach. It has to be grassroots, uh, you know, for sustainability. I think it's stages of a national campaign is, is my view. You, you need to have things for everyone who's passionate about it to um, demonstrate that. And, and uh, the, the stuff in the middle to persuade governments tends to be done by small numbers of people and it doesn't engage everybody. And, and adult education isn't one of the grand narratives that, uh, you know, people emerge out of their... Um, uh, their training or their political backgrounds thinking I know adult education we know it's the answer but you you can sound like people from a you, you know an evangelist sect arguing this case if other people are, aren't hearing it from 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 the ground up thank you Alan Vicky yeah I think um, Alan was just saying about the the place in the middle I think one of the things that we've struggled with in local areas is that um, collaboration between or lack of collaboration between different organizations so there's some, for me there's something about a duty to collaborate yeah. amongst organizations who are providing some kind of um, adult continuing um, education but that's got very fragmented and some of that is a lack of money but actually <laughs> you can do a lot more if, if you have to work together Thank you, Vicky. And I think it was the point was certainly made in the report, but in the Times Higher this week, uh, one of our colleagues, Jonathan, had a piece published about um, the idea of the university only receiving um, funding yeah. in the light of the crisis if they have that commitment to work locally and, yeah. and within communities. So that sort of answers your, your point in a way. Yeah. Thank you. Any other points? I think we've got a couple of minutes. Yeah, uh, if I may, ju just one, you know, almost in opposition to Alan's uh, sort of start locally, um, I, I'm thinking we need in some way to, to engage with the, or, or to get engagement from, from government centrally. Um, and I, I suppose I'm thinking here about, you know, all this stuff which was um, before, the, before the crisis, uh, there was, you know, um, uh, uh, Johnson had taken uh, um, Alison Wolfe into his uh, into his bunker as you know a kind of advisor on this and that and the other and I I wonder about sort of as it were um, trying to engage with that territory even though you know because I, I mean I think um, well I think w if, if one can engage with that and presumably that she was brought in partly because she seems to be the sort of disruptive thinker in the in the in the in the in the Tory, um, whatever it is, Tory um, stable. Um, an, an adult education can be part of a disruptive program of thinking. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alan. I've got Lawrence, and then I've got Dan. So, hello. Hello. Um, yes, my name is Lawrence. Uh, I just wanted to um, say that uh, I agree as well with um, um, other participants that I've uh, talked before. And I wanted to say that uh, it is important to open a dialogue uh, with the universities and uh, other uh, education provider as well with the community. And uh, for example, the healthcare system as well, you know, and the government and they can also use the newspapers or things like that so you're thinking about a campaign that goes right across into civil society 
and, and into the, the care sector, you know, it has to be absolutely wide, doesn't it, Lawrence? Yes. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Dan, we've got two minutes left for yourself and anyone else who wants to come. Need to unmute, Dan. Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, I think one is um, what it means to have a national campaign has changed quite a lot since the last time there was a national campaign. Um, so early 2000s, you know, big TV campaigns and all that, all that sort of thing. Um, I think there's value in looking at things like, you know, for, for example, this run 5K for nomination type, type things. You know, disrupting through social media can have a huge impact but it's quite different to perhaps what we were used to um, last, time, last time we did something like that. And um, just thinking about the DfE and the Learning Work Institute reports on, on participation in adult education, I think the main two things that came out of those is that people don't participate in adult education because they don't know anyone else that does either. So it's that kind of, you know, how do we use that kind of nominate or that kind of disruption to make people's learning much more public um, so it doesn't become kind of a, a, a secret act, which kind of happens in, a, you know, in, in private, but actually we have kind of a, a culture of learning where it's the norm. Thank you. That's a really nice way of putting it. And it's certainly one of the things that it, we're doing at the Cork University's future is, you know, looking at the notion of collective learning, collaborative learning, that sort of public space, and as would be fit a you know, public institution like the university. Thank you very much. One last minute. Who'd like to make a final point, perhaps who hasn't spoken before? You're out there. I can, I'm looking at you. I can see you all. <laughs> no, don't put any pressure. All right, then anyone who has. One last, one last 30 seconds. Where have we got to? What do we need to do? What's the first thing we need to do? Work in contradictory ways. Um, that is, John's right, of course you have to try and persuade people in the middle that their desire to spend more money on FE means uh, adult education too, but in the end, unless we um, address the issue that Dan just raised, we're, we're not going to win the hearts and minds of politicians. Great last point, thank you very much indeed everyone. We're going back now, I think, if I press the right button. Hi everybody, can everyone hear me okay? So nice to, nice to see you all. Um, so I'm the facilitator for this room and just a, just a quick reminder of the question. If you look in chat, I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to successfully um, post that again, but I think everyone should be able to see it. So basically just a quick reminder, how do we build a campaign? So that's the kind of real focus today to put adult education and lifelong learning at the heart of this reconstruction agenda that we've been hearing about. So can I ask if anyone wants to kick us off, please? <clears throat> so just, just raise your hand. I can see everybody fine. If anybody wants to start or we'll just, um, or we'll just go ahead. Does anyone feel a burning desire to start? So were any thoughts sort of stimulated by the, the, the three speakers we've heard? Um, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure people must have some thoughts and ideas. Um, I think for me, it's around ensuring that we put a value to adult education. I think um, people are prepared to stand behind a campaign if they see a value to it. Can I ask you what you mean by it, Jill, just to give us a bit more clarification, because I'm really interested in what I'm saying. Okay, um, so I come from a community ed background and um, often working with very vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. Um, they need to be convinced that there is a value in attending the courses because mm. um, obviously they are giving up their time, their resource. Yeah. Um, so they need to see the benefit of adult education yeah. and to therefore be able to understand the value behind it. And do you think that value comes in the form of um certification or is that a kind of crass response or 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 feeling some economic benefit what do you think 
those benefits might look like. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm interested. I'm also from a community <laughs> background. <laughs> you know I thought about these things too <laughs> yeah yeah I think it's I think it's a bit of a mixture I think um, certification obviously um, is an immediate reward for completing a course yeah, yeah. Um, but I think if people can also um, see that there will be an economic value to their to mm. their learning their education as well that makes mm. a big difference yeah um, I mean part of part of my background is around careers advice as well so often we'd have to kind of start with trying to build people's confidence before they could even get onto the adult ed yeah. um, sort yeah. of ladder. And I think um, if people have had a particularly poor schooling experience, and obviously that's what's come up in, in some of the, the talks there, they don't have the confidence necessarily to engage with adult education. So mm. it, it's kind of trying to break through those sorts of barriers. Mm, absolutely. Thank you very much, Jill. I think that's a that's a really great start to, to kick us off. I um, totally concur with you about confidence as well. Um, and, um, you know, those poor schooling experiences. Um, anyone want to follow on from Jill's comments? Uh, just start moving us on a little bit. Please do. I don't want to talk. <laughs> or too much anyway. <laughs> um, well, um, Shana, I mean, an obvious point is that it's sort of the political one, you know, using yeah. the political processes of get it, getting people to, to lobby their MPs and their local councillors and their, their councils and so on. Um, because it is a bit, bit of a mystery that uh, um, everybody, everybody agrees that, the, that uh, adult education, community education, lifelong mm -hmm. learning, continuing mm -hmm. education is a good thing, makes society um, stronger, it's good for people's well-being and so on yes. and it, uh, it seems to register very low on politicians uh, radars and, and um, they say quite explicitly I think at, at least at the level of MPs that they think their constituents don't don't care they're not interested they what, what they are interested in is is their kids getting to university yeah. so MPs are obsessed with with you know people um, the ability to go to university age 18 yes um, but they they seem to think that that uh, that the constituents aren't interested in anything else. Mm. So I, I think it, we do need to to um, you know uh, mobilise uh, um, um, people who have either sort of you know benefited, enjoy, appreciate um, adult education uh, to communicate that to their councillors, their, their MPs, and those yeah. who are missing out <laughs> where where things have been underfunded, shut down, etc. Yes. You know, likewise, lobby lobby MPs because at the moment I think it's just not not registering. No, I think that's a really good point. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And uh, just totally support Jonathan's point about political processes. I think one of my contributions to the report on and off has been about the importance of um, critical thinking and political thinking to help us better engage with democracy. And having read an article only today about the decline of democracy um, across Europe at this particular time, it feels even more important. And I guess that's all tied in with these processes of local engagement with local authorities, local councillors, local MPs, as well as the more, uh, the broader national and, and, uh, and global issues as well. Does anybody want to follow on from that? I'd be interested to hear other people's perspectives on that, uh, particularly if you have any thoughts on the political aspects of what we're describing as, as well as part of our reconstruction. I, th I think, um, Sharon, we're in a world, aren't we, where you know, things are going to be different coming out. Um, yeah. Whatever they are. And are we, do we agree that people are in the place where they don't want to be told what to do? Yeah. They want to make the decisions themselves. And I'm just thinking about you know, the whole thing about adult education. You know, we know we've been involved with it for a while, but us actually, you know, putting on more adult education doesn't mean that people will participate. And maybe that comes to Jonathan's point about the constituents thinking actually it's not really that important, or their perception is not important. But we know the example, and Rochdale was certainly a good one, where money was available to get people together to decide what they wanted to do to make their community better. And mm. What did it end up being? It was learning activities. Whether it was that education, um, you know, how we define that, but actually what it all came down to was they wanted learning activities, but they didn't want to be told they wanted learning activities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It had to come from them. 
yes. yeah 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 um <clears throat> excellent point so you know we do get accused don't we frequently of being apathetic as a as communities and as a, as a nation as a whole or, or apolitical or depoliticized whatever the words are but uh, i think sometimes it's a feeling that people maybe need to come up with these ideas themselves does anyone else want to follow on from phil's point on that and, well more to the point how are we building our campaign then around adult education which is the key point that we're we're addressing in this session i would like to hear from other people i can see quite a few people hoping that someone's going to put the hand up linda i think you've just done that <laughs> yeah I, a slightly different strand really if we're talking about you know raising the profile and 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 the value, uh, public value of adult education as a refugee really originally from one of the university adult education departments that closed down yes. Manchester. I think the other issue is how, how do we lobby, how do we work with universities so that their civic and community engagement is, is broadened again yes. to include adult education. It's been lost that there are some wonderful exceptions. Yes. And, um, whether that's politicians or whether that's Hefke or whoever, then some lobbying has surely to be done within the remit of universities and how they see their role in the communities because that's a great tradition that's almost entirely been lost. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and because universities didn't value it, or I'm not sure the reason that the funding formulas, there's a whole plethora of reasons, but if we're going to lobby for adult education, then you know, reinventing the past or at least looking back to our past, mm. then let's not forget the role that extramurals adult education yeah. played and look at what happened, why that's been, why we've been squeezed out. Yeah. Um, yeah. That certainly needs to be on an agenda for, for lobbying, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think that's absolutely right. I was just going to say, we know from our own research that, um, well, two things really. One, that there's a, a huge interest in, in in civic university engagement at the moment, which pe people may or may not have seen the Civic University Commission report that came out in February last year, and that that's really important because it reasserts the importance of universities as anchor institutions in their local area, but also adult education, adult learning. Um, so it gives us a lever, if nothing else. I think. The problem we've had is so many of these reports came out last year and it's been such a turbulent time that the very time when we might be able to make some real inroads a lot of the impetus um i wouldn't say got lost but got kind of occluded by all kinds of political and and um and shifts that we've we've all experienced in so that's important but i think um certainly it's interesting because we've developed an online adult education response to COVID-19 at the University of Nottingham, where I work with Professor John Holford. And it's, it's going a bomb really, because people really want it. I think that this is the absolute time when we need to be pressing this even more. We've got five minutes left, everybody. So um, please pitch in if you've got comments, because um, there's lots of people. Just to link a couple of things there, Sharon. And yeah. what Alan Tuckett said, he was on about the Scandinavian example of learning circles. And Simon was on about going back to where we were 100 years ago in some ways. And I, it's interesting that about, again, building on what I'm saying about doing what people want, not what we say. Um, visiting Sweden ABF uh, five, six years ago, we talked about their learning circles experience. And their most popular course at that time was how to survive a zombie apocalypse. And of course, that would have prepared people for dealing with COVID-19, because that's what it was really all about. Oh, really? Again, it's, you know, one thinks that wouldn't be a right sort of course, but maybe it was the course we should have done. I don't know how well Sweden have done, because you know, the figures and things are uh, not mm. all clear to understand, are they, where mm. we are with COVID-19. Is this really a time for, for definitely an interesting time for uh, reflecting on what we need in terms of university um, teaching and and also the part-time learner numbers just to say it's been such a catastrophic drop i think about 60 percent over the last 10 years or, or possibly less that i think you know attention at the universities are starting to have to think about um groups beyond in terms of widening participation beyond the 18 to 21 year olds so um you know maybe our time has come in the worst possible ways at the worst possible moment again for some re, re refresh recalibration 
Anything just, else? Okay. We haven't got long, just, so uh, just back on the question: Should <laughs> we then, you know, do we think that what we should be doing is asking all adults what they think they need for reconstruction, which we then hope, if Rochdale has followed, they want learning? Yeah, that's that's one way. So it certainly is, and also, you know, Jonathan's point about campaigning at local level, or at least talking to local MPs and others. Um, I don't know. What do people think? I mean, how do we? re-energize this campaign or get this campaign on the road i would like to hear from other people good jackie it's maybe just the presence of just being there just you know asking and um, constantly being in our community centers local libraries and things like that you know just um showing the amazing things that we are constantly striving to do all the time mm -hmm. and constantly asking for feedback what mm -hmm. can we do better how can we best save our communities mm -hmm. you're thinking at local level i presume then Jackie. yeah you're yeah, thinking about yeah how you really engage local communities mm -hmm. that ongoing presence and um, persistence yeah <laughs> definitely, definitely yeah you do have to be really persistent don't you you do. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really helpful point. Any anyone else got any others they want to add in? Because we've time's ticking. We've got about a couple of minutes left, two or three minutes max. I, I would be really interested. Oh great. Hello, I can't I can't see your name, so please um H E J2. <laughs> yeah, it's so annoying uh, that um you know, my uh, anyway that acronym comes up. Um it's Hazel, Hazel Johnson. And oh, Hazel. Hi, hi. Um, I, I was just following up on the last couple of points, actually, that um, it, it does seem to me that uh, any campaign does have to uh, go to local. Uh, the question is, how local do you need to go? But, it, but given the number of organisations that have been involved in the Commission, and also potentially could be involved in some process beyond this one, um, uh, and including libraries. I mean, I'm glad somebody mentioned libraries. Um, it, it, there, there are many organisations that could be actually part of a campaign um, and, and actually finding out the kinds of things that people would like uh, to, to be doing. And it, it, it's, it's quite hard, I think, um, because people don't necessarily know immediately. But on the other hand, if it's linked to some shared experience, which we've now all had, that at least is a starting point about, you know, what do we want to see happening differently in society from how things were before and how do we, you know, uh, move forward into the future? That, that those kind of questions. Um, and, you know, and it might, it might, you might get all sorts of surprising answers actually, yeah. um, including ones that we may not uh, share, but it, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter, it, but it is, is a way of kind of raising the, um, the the kind of profile of 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 adult education and that it can yeah. mean many different things yeah um, we've got to go in a minute i'm very yeah. sorry. sorry it's okay we've literally got one minute so i'm just going to say thank you very much for that so you're and just so I can, i'm clear in terms of responding back from us all that that's really about local ownership local understanding engaging with as many organizations at local level as possible to promote those messages Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think we're about to go back into the room and um, I'll feed back from us. Please chip in if I get anything wrong or miss anything. Thank you. Enjoyed those sessions. Uh, what we normally do now is we ask each facilitator to, to really just flag up three points, no more. We round about a minute and a bit each. I'm sorry, it's so... It's so brevity is key here and then then we ask the speakers if they have a, a very short response anything they they've heard that they think is particularly relevant or interesting that they'd like to respond to and then i hand over to helen to kindly uh pull you know just to finish us all off neatly uh in terms of pulling the thing together so um Mel melanie you were the, the first uh, facilitator would you like to maybe share a couple of points hi mel Hi. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. So, um, yeah, we had quite a wide ranging um, discussion, really, that um, had both, I suppose, the fear of the impact of other financial realities on um, 
the ability of uh, uh, the sector being able to respond or add education and reskilling. But also, I think some fairly strong messages around um, the opportunities, really. So um, in this notion of restart, revival, renewal, um, that adult education and the reality that the reality is that millions of people are going to be unemployed um, and will require reskilling and upskilling is is a real opportunity in terms of um, uh, in terms of adult education. And I think there was also then a really clear point about but just because that's the opportunity around employment, we need to make sure that that is 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 much wider. And it just is not just skills focused. Um, so those kind of any of those multi stakeholder initiatives, which are already in place and will continue to to kind of be happening, that that kind of systematic approach to learning is 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 viewed as much wider than a than a than a, an, a, an economic problem solver. Um, and and again, uh, I think um, interestingly relating back to last week's conversation, that key role of um, local authorities. And being part of those conversations that are already starting to happen in local authorities now. Thank you very much indeed, Mala. Fantastic points. And don't forget, we'll capture all these and, and make sure they're they're available to everybody. Simon, you had uh, you were facilitating a uh, room two. Yes, thanks, Silla. Um, and yeah, really good discussion. Um, we started from the, from the point that this, you know, when we talk about a movement, we really mean that this needs to be people and, and community led. This isn't organ this isn't a conversation about organisations just just fighting for the money. This has to be people and community led and build on those mutual aid groups that we've seen establish, you know, right across the UK. It's really important. And also that things, you know, we're not in a period of reflection. Things are moving really, really fast. And we need to make sure that that movement's relevant for when to the new landscape and that it's relevant to all adults from 19, 19 plus. Um, so we have to have a, a position and understand the big themes that we'll be faced with. You know, we've mentioned employment, stroke unemployment, health, digital access, climate change. You know, these are the big issues that we'll be facing in, in the new landscape. And then we also mentioned that there is a key role for LAs and mayoral authorities, and we're seeing some movement there. The Cooperative Councils Network is a good example of, of how we can engage with state mechanisms. But then also, and I think it came up in last week's sem seminar, there is a, there's a role for the movement to remind corporate and big business that it's, it's got a responsibility post this crisis phase and and how do we hook in, into them around CSR and other agendas so that you know we're really driving some positive change off the back of this what struck me finally from our group was how positive it was in terms of planning ahead now it wasn't we weren't caught in the moment of this crisis it was how do we make sure that we're we're, we're ready to be relevant when we come through this Thank you, Simon. That's fantastic. Um, Helen, you were facilitating room three. Thank you. You need to unmute. Thank you. Secretly mute us up again without telling us. <laughs> um, but, you know, too late now. I'll learn the technology for the next series of seminars. <laughs> so, uh, similar themes for us. Um, just sort of in first order, picking up Simon's comments just there. Uh, Rob talked very uh, inspiringly about the importance of joining up locally and the potential role of the local authority, giving uh, the example in his case of Glasgow and the learning city experience they've had. But this absolutely vital point that Simon uh, talked about, which is this is what are the big issues that need dealing with? Uh, and it isn't just the economy and it isn't just work and skills, it is health, it's the environment, uh, it's uh, a sense of participation. So being clear uh, of what our problems are that we're trying to solve and thinking about how we solve them at a local uh, level and the power of local authorities and city regions and the mayors to do that, very important. Uh, we also talked about um, how we find even more examples of, of people who've carried on despite, um, uh, despite the challenges, whether it's digital challenges, whether it's the current challenges of lockdown or life or employment or children or whatever. Um, uh, the, um, uh, Claire talked about finding in the, through the WEA work in the West Midlands, positive deviance, meaning the people who've just carried on, 
uh, and they can give heart and optimism to others. Um, and the last thing was really this point again, that this has got to be people and community led. Um, it's not top down, it isn't for politicians. Uh, people have got to feel that they can create the future that they want. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, I'm going to report back from room four, and mine really are lots of key words because we did reflect a, a number of the other uh, points that were made here in our discussion, not least the, the need for the local, the grassroots to make for sustainability and so on. But we also came up with some other sort of tangible outcomes or ideas for a campaign around, say, entitlement throughout the life course. So people have particular moments where you're entitled yep. to, you know, funding for learning and that that can, you know, in Simon's piece, it was about how that can happen all through your life. And, and that would be something we'd be looking at. We were we talked about some of the, the, the interesting things that have happened in the crisis, like the slowness, the kindliness. That the way that people are yeah. connecting is is that something you know slow learning it seems to go totally as at odds really <laughs> to what we were talking about earlier with the, the online stuff but you know maybe there's something there too we also talked that we also said that of course a lot of learning is private how do we make it public because alan reminded us you know adult education isn't a grand narrative you know we might all think it makes sense and is wondrous and so on but how do we actually convince other people and sometimes it's sort of hidden away in something one does individually so how do we make it more public and we concluded really that some of the ways we might do that in addition to making that link between the local and the national because we do believe we need that wider political agenda is that we actually were quite, we're, not, we're unafraid of being disruptive in, in how we go about trying to engage people into this idea of learning and you know people were talking about the different strategies that are currently used to grab attention for example yeah. the 5k run which has huge impact and you know just just how we might we might really try and engage people and then finally finally i guess is that you know we we, we, need, we need to be unafraid of being contradictory in what we try and do that road map that, that simon showed before in that illustration it was messy learning is uh, and, and i mean but the, the idea that we actually really embrace the notion of, of collaboration that was that was yeah. a big point for us so i'll thank myself on that and then i'll move on to sharon who you who was facilitating room five hello sharon yeah thank you very much Silla. so just a couple of um key points from us just slightly different from others um but all um in line with other comments so really i think we felt very strongly in our group that there was a real need for building local capacity and engagement with adult education we can't assume for instance that everyone automatically understands or sees the value of of adult education particularly some of the most disadvantaged and vulnerable groups and that we have to think about ways of rewarding and engaging people who perhaps have had poor schooling experiences. It may be actually about building confidence in the first instance. We have to think too about not telling people that they want adult education and finding creative ways yeah. of getting people to actually recognise that it's something that they want. Um, Jonathan made a very good point about political processes and the importance of being able to influence local councillors, local MPs. We're we are concerned, despite this notion that adult education is really um, perhaps at a bit of a crossroads at the moment in terms of potential influence, just how little it seems to register on politicians' radars. So the importance of mobilising communities, but also doing it at a very local grassroots level. So any campaign we felt had to be resolutely local, using organisations, in the community at local level to build the campaign getting them involved libraries and others and uh, hazel made that comment and a number of others just being there in the community being really persistent and being present in in the community at, at, and libraries and recognizing that you sometimes have to build it's not instantaneous and it's not quick and finally a point dear to my heart that, that linda made really important that the university is really pitch in here and recognize their absolutely vital role in uh, civic their role as civic universities learning from our own history the extramural departments the brilliant adult education departments that we've had that have all virtually been lost uh, thank you that's it 
Thank you so much, Sharon. That's that's uh, that's fantastic. With some really extraordinary points being made. Again, don't forget they're down in the chat. Um, well, you know, so that we can keep 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 an eye on those. I'd like to just very quickly ask our speakers just to spend no more than a minute, really, just uh, responding to any of those points they heard, anything they'd like to say. And I, if, if uh, I could, I'd just begin with asking Alan anything you'd like to to comment on in the light of those that feedback. A lot of people said we, we need to engage with people locally and to make alliances across um, a, a range of settings, uh, and I agree with that. I, I think what was missing from the conversation, maybe, is how do you learn from one another um, yeah. through the telling of the stories of what we're doing? And you do need sort of posh frock days to make a fuss of what's going on as part of building a campaign. So you work locally, but you also share that in some way across the kind of networks we have. And I, I think um, people, frankly, politicians are more persuaded by a good party than by a good argument. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. Thanks so much. Um, Melissa, would you like to maybe make a comment about something you heard that was of particular interest? Um, well, I, I think the nature of working and learning has changed enormously in the last 50 days. And we're all working from home and every education institution is delivering at a distance now. So all the universities and all the schools and all the colleges are doing their teaching remotely. I wonder whether, in fact, even the idea that we want to come together and hang out together and spit on each other and do a 5K run and be in close contact, I'm not sure that it will all go back uh, to those kinds of ways of, of working and learning. Um, I think that the emphasis on whether or not homes are connected is shifting very fast because people are missing out on entertainment and access to schooling and all kinds of things and I think that more and more homes are rethinking whether or not they have broadband and internet connections because we're in lockdown now and we could be again at any time. So the kinds of thinking that the universities are all doing is what to do for semester one and we're all yeah. assuming we're teaching remotely the entire provision of the university for certainly semester one possibly semester two which for us is, you know, thousands and thousands of courses. The students are not going to want to come back and live in petri dishes, sorry, halls of residences. You know, there's going to be a complete shift in, in size and shape and possibly the mergers of institutions. Some of them are going to go under. So I think that assuming that universities and that business is going to have adult education anywhere on its list of things to do is only going to be likely if we, if we link it to to work and workplace learning and how people reskill for that. I don't, I think the universities, a bunch of universities are completely screwed. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. I tend to agree. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Um, Simon, final point from you as a speaker, thank you. Yeah, no, th thanks, Hilla. And um, building on a couple of themes that we've, we've heard that almost, you know, Alan started us with, you know, we need to go back and learn from ourselves. A little bit and then the the whole sense and it was in it was in the question you know we used the word campaign but you know that's that shifted in our group quite quickly to campaign movement people-led community-led and you know that's the the real um takeaway for me for this session that this has to be you know people-led and community-led and if we we follow alan's sort of view that politicians like a good you know respond to a good news story or a good party as much as as anything then I think it was Mar Martin in our group that mentioned you know and in the tradition that we all come from you know I know there's a week for everything but you know a return to adult learners week and actually enough of us on this call from organizations that can support that nationally and really showcase pick you know one moment in the year where we all come together you know, and showcase the, you know, the difference that we all know and believe this can make. So it's a, a very practical thing. It's a very twee example, maybe. But actually, I think it could be hugely powerful. So getting back to that sense of let's build this movement and let's shout about it from the rooftops. Thank you. Uh, very much indeed, Simon. You won't have seen, but I use my newfound uh, um, 
I know it's just... there to <laughs> that final point. Just, you become quite childish on this thing, seeing what you can do. Thank you so much. Uh, three fantastic observations, really, in, t in, in the light of what's, what's been a very rich session. And I feel like we're leaving this series, this short series, with quite a lot of hope. And I'm not underestimating what's going on elsewhere or being flippant. But I think enough of us have engaged in this call with lots of ideas. It's challenging and difficult. And, you know, Melissa reminds us of the reality of, of something, things that we're going to have to face going forward. But that overall commitment and, and people's ideas have been extremely constructive and helpful. So thank you so much. And for the final time in this series, I'll hand over to Helen uh, to, uh, to thank, thank everyone and to make a few final points. Thanks, Helen. Thank you so much, Silla. And um, enormous thanks to you and all of your team, the, techni the technical team has just been just brilliant so so thanks very very much to them um uh, i do i put up my clapping hands so i knew how to do that uh, 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 this is as we i said at the beginning and i think you were just saying then so this has been an incredibly useful series of seminars and what it does make me think your heart will sink Scylla, uh is that we should do this again uh, because it's not a one-off uh, and it's not a one-off campaign um i I, I love the fact that we had mentioned early on, I think, of, of dancing in Brazil. Someone, were you talking about dancing in Brazil? We've had dancing and posh frocks, as it were, at one end, or as one kind of campaigning. And then we've had that very, um, lots of people have talked about, I suppose, in many ways, the just absolutely consistent, local, bottom-up, community-based campaigning. Um, but I've always felt that um, for change in society, just looking back at the times when change has really happened. Um, and this time we believe is an opportunity to um, accelerate real change. You need all the players to be involved. It's great that we've got Lord Bill Moria on hand who can represent the employers. It's great that we've got so many people at a, who are such experienced teachers, whether WEA, whether local further education institutions, whether those of you teaching um, in universities. Um, it's great that we've got some politicians who are interested and we need to make them more interested yet than they are now. So my feeling is, and in consultation with other members of the commission and um, some participants who've raised these points, in a sense, what we need to do is to have a multifaceted campaign and think about how we stick together. We all do the thing that we can do most effectively with the people we can do it most effectively with. Um, and that seems to me what the next thing that we need to be doing as a commission. So, I mean, it did seem to me that at some stage, possibly, well, virtually worked so well, um, that in the next six months or so, we should think about re-meeting, regrouping, and seeing how we're getting on and um, getting the wonderful and inspiring ideas from a wider group about what we need to do next. So uh, more work for the commission, more work for some of us, but just immensely, immensely valuable input. And thanks very much. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you everyone for participating and, and as you did, my final thanks to the college team for the great work uh, in getting us all here and look forward to meeting you all again soon and, and continuing to share ideas. Thank you very much indeed. Bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Pleasure. Nice to see you all again. Bye bye.